Hi there, good morning everybody. Firstly, just to introduce you to the 21st century world, you shouldn't have any problem recognising this, of course, because this is where you live. Uh, it is the 21st century world, there are 7 billion of us. Uh, the population is growing at about 2% per annum. Life expectancy, in this part of the world at least, is in the 60 to 80 year old. And the mission of people in general seems to be celebrity and leisure. Uh, the idea of having to work for a living is somehow becoming less popular than it was uh, just a generation ago, certainly in my time. Um, and I think that uh, the other thing which is quite a feature of this world is these electronic systems that surround us everywhere. The, uh, what have we got there? The GPS, the printer, the Kindle, your smartphone, you wouldn't be seen dead without it. Games, electronics in the home. Uh, TVs, everything like that is, is, uh, 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 surrounds us today and is an important feature. And I'm calling these things and coining the term electronic systems because there are terms like IT and ICT and electronics and embedded software. They abound in this area and every time that they, they come up they cause difficulties because some people say I'm part of this group, I'm not part of that group. And the term electronic systems is a fairly natural term which describes what these things are and it's also something I can explain to, to, um, to people who are non-technologists. And about these electronic systems that you see here, they're important but they're not vital. So you can manage without your camera, without your TV, um, without your uh, remote controls and your Kindles. Um, they're very personal items on the other hand and that means you value them. So they are valued by you but they're not what you consider to be strategically important. However, there are a lot of other electronic systems, and again, you're technologists, so you see them, uh, but other people are less aware of them. These are health service, security, um, finance, uh, radar, things like the congestion charges, satellites, um, the high-performance computer, which is my car, um, and also things like the cup of tea. I like the cup of tea because it's a good illustration of a number of things. The materials technology to create the cup, the logistics to make sure that the, uh, the water, cl clean water and the tea manufactured somewhere out there in the world is brought together in such a way that it has practically no value and yet actually represents quite a pinnacle of human achievement in itself. But these are electronic systems the, that are underpin all of these fundamental parts of our lives and actually if they were to go away then they're a lot more serious. These are vital, and they are, pers they, they are um, sorry, they're vital personally, environmentally, and economically. The country couldn't live without these. Uh, if the country doesn't live, there's no budgets. The budgets don't, they help to support your education, but they also support the uh, research activities that go on. They are largely invisible, however, and that means that society as a whole doesn't value them. We know that electronic systems then will create our future. And it's interesting to look back, it's not very long ago, 1960, when there was finite number of computers in any given world, in any given country. Uh, back in 1960 there was, they were mainframe computers, they had a room of their own. You didn't have computers in things like phones and cars and calculators. TVs didn't have remote controls and they certainly didn't have a computer in them. Nowadays we're heading towards the Internet of Things environment where we're talking about hundreds of billions of computers around us. The electronic systems um, already quite dependent, we are already quite dependent on them but we are going to become absolutely dependent on them in every way. So it's appropriate then, I think, that we spend a bit of time to understand where they come from, um, our various roles within them, our businesses' involvements in them, and to try and minimise our exposure to them as a nation, uh, as any particular country, uh, to their globalisation. Because these are products of the world, and if we're not very careful, then you will be supplied by the world and therefore vulnerable to continuation of that supply. So do, do we have a problem? Well, 
Yes, we do. This is one survey which was conducted by Engineering UK in 2011. Engineering UK is a, uh, an organisation which is supported by the government and they do a, a survey of all of the major characteristics of engineering, the whole, whole spectrum of engineering in the UK. So they're looking at things like uh, civil engineering and industrial engineering and all sorts of things as well as electronics and uh, embedded software and so on. Uh, part of what they do in the collection of statistics is they do some individual surveys and in this particular year they did a survey on the perception of engineers and engineering and they asked engineers role in, ta in tackling climate change and uh, they, they were quite impressed by the first part of this question because it showed that most people were very aware of or the importance of engineering in trying to uh, solve or tackle the climate change issues. So that first part looks pretty good. But the second part of the question was perhaps more revealing. Um, when asked what developments in the last 50 years that engineers had been involved in uh, had had significant impact on their lives, 50% of people couldn't think of any. So they couldn't think of any thing that engineers had done in the last 50 years which had had an impact on their lives. That's a scary thing. So they knew that engineers were going to be important in tackling climate change but actually they hadn't got a clue what engineers do. I think if I were you I'd be worried about that. We have been very good at delivering technology to all sorts of aspects of modern life but as we've done it our roles in doing it have disappeared. So, we now have some pretty clever magic. I mean, here is a stone. It is the same stone as in the picture. And here is a phone. It's a pretty clever thing that we do to take apart the atoms of this phone and to assemble them one at a time in a structured and ordered way to make this phone. You could wait a long time for that stone to ring. You'd have to wait a lot less for this phone to ring. <coughs> it's a small achievement, we see, but actually it's a huge achievement. It's based on all of those histories of engineers and engineering scientists that have gone, that have gone before us, the mathematicians and the predictors, such that we can build on that knowledge, that background, to create this science, which is so wonderful that people ignore. Um, and although it's very, very clever, maybe even very, very, very clever, it's an important point to bear in mind here, it is not magic. We don't take the stone and go abracadabra, poof, and it turns into a foam. That's something which we know you have to do by a laborious process. You take it apart, you have to decide how you're going to put it back together, and you put it back together in a structured and ordered way. It's a very complex thing we do, but it's not magic. Now Arthur C. Clarke had something to say about that. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And it is worth remembering then that if we are producing magic as far as the public is concerned, then that makes us magicians. Magicians are great when things are going well. To be a, to be a magician is good when things are going well. But when things start going wrong, then that's what ducking stools were invented for. And uh, pyres, you know, we'll find out the really good magicians because we'll chuck them on a fire and see how they burn. The good ones will, of course, magic themselves out, and the bad ones, oh, it's explainable, they were never any good anyway. And just for the record, I understand that scientists burn a little bit brighter than engineers. <coughs> now, everybody then has a threshold of magic. And it's a concept which doesn't, you'll not find in any textbook that I've ever come across. But it's basically, you have areas where you don't know, and you're quite happy to accept they don't work. They just work. You have areas that you do know, and you understand how they work. And because you understand, you, you realise that they are uh, not magic. So chemical systems, biological systems, economic systems, and electronic systems. Electronics is perhaps the bit that you do understand, the other ones, well... Fortunately, you leave it for somebody else to understand those. Biology, we know about in the sense that it works. You just chuck some grass seed on the ground, and grass grows. You throw an oak, uh, an acorn onto the ground, and an oak tree grows. Uh, as far as the, uh, as far as uh, money is concerned, fortunately, there's somebody else who understands it because the current lot don't seem to understand it terribly well. But the threshold of magic then for most people who are well educated but not scientifically educated is about the level of the light bulb. 
it's enough to know that uh, they've taken a battery, they've taken a couple of bits of wire and they've taken an incandescent lamp bulb they've connected it up and they can see that the wire inside glows so hot that it gives off light that's about it bear that in mind because when they do surveys of which of the engineers are particularly uh, remembered in the UK then they always come up with Brunel and sometimes they come up with James Watt uh, Brunel of course built bridges and ships and stuff and Watt was the steam engine man and really that's probably about the level of science and technology that most people in the, world, in the UK most people in, uh, in public life have an inherent understanding of and all of the stuff that we're doing is beyond their threshold of magic we all fail however if we depend on that because it's our failure to explain what we do that's actually producing this misunderstanding our roles will not be recognized our teaching and our research will go our technical jobs will follow we can't all be consumers without those roles there will, there will be nobody producing the money and the money which is ultimately going to be used to buy the products so failure will follow as, li as night follows day our society, probably most, most worryingly, will become dependent on others. So just like the shortage of fossil fuel uh, causes a problem uh, to nations that don't have it, the shortage of uh, people with expertise in electronic systems will also start to impact um, uh, a nation's ability to, uh, to be economically independent. So it's not something that we need as a nation, we need individually and so it's, it's in our interest to make sure that we do something to explain this so I'm going to do some storytelling now these are the sort of sto stories that your mum and your dad and uh, the, the man in the street hopefully will understand because it, they are illustrations of the sort of thing that we have been busy doing to start with we build on the shoulders of giants it's a small thing to say but there are many hundreds of engineers and scientists who've, pre who've preceded us and they've given us abilities and, t and tricks and methods which are going to enable us to achieve the thing that we're, cr we're currently achieving these days it's supported and enhanced by globalization standardization of tools and methods international contract law containerization in English language as a lingua franca these are all part of the 21st century environments and there will be different things in the 21st century these are the whole environment is the thing which enables us to uh, to accelerate our capabilities and they are accelerating at an ever increasing pace so I'm going to go back though because back is where it all starts 35,000 years ago Cro-Magnon man which is us emerged out of the Homo sapien hundred thousand year old um, uh, hundred thousand year longer uh, creature which was humanoid um, but if you take a 30, 35 thousand year Cro-Magnon man and you put him in today's education system brought him up in the way that you were brought up then he would have very similar abilities to, to today's man so there's been effectively no serious evolution in the last 35 thousand years to put some scale on it then the philosophers of which you will have heard came in around two and a half thousand years ago and their their mission if you like was to discover basic properties of matter now presumably they uh, they had uh, by that point got sufficient food that actually where the next meal was coming from wasn't their highest concern their uh, their, ne their concern was to start to look at things and say oh look when I boil a uh, a can of water it turns into steam and, uh, and if I bang two bricks together I break uh, well, not bricks of course they didn't have bricks in those days but bang two stones together there's an inside and they can look at the characteristics and they came up with three elements of fire water and uh, ether I think but uh, let's just say it was an early model of an, uh, of an existence it didn't really have any exploitation potential the scientists who came along a little later nearly one and a half thousand years later in fact um, they started saying well what happens when you okay I've got steam what could I do with it and the uh, uh, the classic uh, Galileo steam engine with a with a ball and little jets of steam coming out which is a bit of a novelty to show how a jet of steam actually can impart, impart rotating motion was the sort of thing that the scientists were producing this is still not exploitable material 
but it's a good example of, okay, material, materials have properties and I can use them for things. But it wasn't until the engineers made an appearance just 250 years ago in the Industrial Revolution. Now, uh, people talk about the Industrial Revolution. I remember doing it in school and they never talked about really the role of engineers or the social impact of it or anything else like that. It was very much weaving and water, uh, the canals, the ability to transport things. Really, what happened at the uh, Industrial Revolution was all of this science and uh, philosophy about materials that had been invested suddenly hit an exploitation potential. So what happened with the engineers is they were the first group who exploited nature. And that's a good point, and I'll come back to that one. Now, to, that's what we were in, the situation we were in, after 32,000 years of existence before the philosophers. That was a very slow progress. 32,000 years to get the technology of low, dry stone walls, wooden poles, thatch, timber, and sharp stones for cutting. That's not a particularly impressive rate of progress if you measure it in today's terms. We were in danger of extinction world population of around 100,000 to a million. That's a fraction of the population of Liverpool. So, just to put it in some context. So, Industrial Revolution then unleashed the power of science uh, by delivering it in ways that satisfied a volume need. And of course, one of the things that you, uh, you had to do if you were going to deliver your wonderful uh, capability to all the people was to give the people an ability to buy it. And so money moved out from very much the preserve of kings and lords, where they were doing big stuff, uh, into the ordinary people. So for the first time the consumer was invented, and the consumer had money, and the consumer was in the position to start to buy things which mattered to them. Satisfying a human need, bear that one in mind. People only buy things which satisfy a human need. And it did begin in the UK, and it did sp spread out through the rest of the world, um, and it did make use of mechanisation, iron making, canals, improved roads, food availability, things of that nature were the driving forces. But the fundamental thing was the exploitation of nature, and it happened just 250 years ago. Now in the time of my life, Starting essentially in 1940, electronics made an appearance. Now this is fine because this is not just exploiting nature, this is exploiting the atom, or indeed uh, exploiting the electron within an atom. Who's to say? Who could, who could even doubt that there is another science which is more exciting than this? We're taking atoms, we're reassembling them, and we're, and we're making use of the electron around the atom to achieve something which is going to satisfy a human need. Now that human need could be decoding the gene code, it could be uh, helping with medicine, it could be helping with security, but the fundamental technology behind of all of this is the stuff that we guys are working on. And it only happened, only started, 70 years ago. So here's my life along that line. Started with valves, moved through to the integrated transistor. Pretty exciting stuff, actually. And some of the people that you'll, you'll be familiar with, of course, or one of the people you'll be familiar with is Gordon Moore. Everybody's heard of Moore's Law. Perhaps less appreciated is that when he made this observation, he had himself been working on a chip with eight transistors on it. He'd done another one a little later with 16 transistors in it. He was now leading a project group which had, uh, making an integrated circuit which had 50 transistors in it. He made this observation on tiny, tiny integrated circuits. And in fact, it was um, Carver Mead, based on an article in Electronics Magazine five years later, roughly, that, um, that, he, uh, was, that the term Moore's Law was coined. And of course, we're, we're all familiar with it now. Uh, but it's interesting to look at just how much bigger the devices are that we're talking about. Now, the top line, and focus on the top line for the moment, shows the doubling of integrated circuit transistors every 18 months to two years. It's probably not appreciated that when ARM was born, and most of you will have heard of ARM, and we'll come back to talk about it a little later anyway, but when ARM was born, which is only 22 years ago, 23 years 
22 years actually, um, the integrated circuits that we were talking about designing at that time had a capacity of about a million transistors. Today, you can buy a 20 billion transistor integrated circuit for five pounds. That's your memory card in your, in your smartphone or in your, in your camera. 20 billion transistors, that's 20,000 times more transistors, more functionality in a circuit in 21 years, 22 years. That's a lot of increased capacity. It's no wonder that we've had to change our methodology, our design tools, our production methods, our whole philosophy about designing the things, because you can imagine that when you're designing an integrated circuit with eight transistors on it, it's not nearly as big a problem as when you're designing a trans uh, circuit with 20 billion transistors on it. And the, the, the ways and the, the approaches that you're going to use and the scale of the team and the, uh, everything associated with it has got to be appropriate with the scale of this activity. That's part of why we've been investing more time and effort and methods and tools and why it's not easy to continue to design an integrated circuit like you did it last year because this year's integrated circuit has got twice as much capacity and so it goes. Now, we all know how small transistors are, don't we? Answer is mostly no, we don't. We know they're small, but how small is small? I mean, they're... You can see some models here which have been produced by Asen Asenov in Glasgow University. Uh, the one along the top is showing, uh, if you like, a more uh, unified, smoothed out uh, v version of a transistor. You can see the, uh, the drain and source and the gate region, although you can't see the gate. The, uh, the vertical collection is the uh, a more typical illustration of how a transistor might look. What Asen has done, though, is shown at the bottom, bottom left and top right, atoms in that same scale. These are the, and the top right it's the impurity atoms, in the bottom right it's the whole matrix and the impurity atoms are slightly uh, different shaded. Now, we know then that our transistors are pretty small when they're getting down to the size of an atom, don't we? No we don't, because we don't actually have much of an idea about how small an atom is, except that you can't see them with the naked eye, so that makes them pretty small, but we can't see a transistor with the naked eye either, so you know, there's something going on here. Well, here's a, um, a, a real human uh, factor for you. You could put 3,000 30 nanometer transistors side by side in the thickness of a banknote. Now, most of you have got a banknote. And if you haven't actually got one at the moment, you probably know a friend who has. But next time one is passing, just look at it sideways on, and there's not much in it. And you can put 3,000 transistors on there. Well, actually, we, I forgot one thing, and that's Moore's Law. Uh, we can actually put nearly 6,000 there today because when I did this diagram it was over a year ago and uh, progress, we're now not working on 30 nanometer but we're working on 14, 14 nanometer transistors. So all this, this is increasing as perpetual nature. To give you some other idea about what that means, that's the area, the edge of your banknote, where your typical picture takes on a memory card. So that's a picture that you've taken with your smartphone or with your camera and that's the space that it takes on the physical space on the surface of the chip inside that uh, inside that memory um, uh, card that you bought for five pounds. It's not very big. So we know now a little bit about how big uh, transistors are. Um, here's an NVIDIA Tigra, Tegra 3 processor chip which is about a billion transistors. Um, now most of you have seen a chip, there's some earbuds there to give people scale, we're looking a little bit closer at it, you can see some structure on it, you certainly can't see the transistors, you can see some circles which shouldn't be there at this point, we'll come back to that. Um, but I think the, the, the point is that when you start to burrow down into that, you find as you get closer you still can't see the tr transistors, but you have to get down to this sort of level before you start to see the transistors. Those, there are three, of the, three transistors there, three of the billion on this integrated circuit. And you can see that connecting them is not a trivial task. All of these tracks across the top are actually the bits of wire which are connecting up those three transistors. You can start to imagine just how complicated it is, not just to put three, uh, a billion transistors down on a piece of silicon, but actually to connect them all up in a meaningful way so that they do deliver the functionality which is what a customer will ultimately pay for. 
<coughs> now one thing that, Moore's, that the Moore's Law diagram that I showed before didn't really show was the, or didn't really pursue was the second line down there. This, is, this came out not from um, Moore himself but from the International Technology Roadmap for Sil Silicon. 1999. They stopped producing this useful graph at that point but nevertheless it serves my purpose as well so I still keep using it. It shows actually the, the problem that although the Moore's Law was progressing on the top line two times every 18 months the productivity of the design tools was not. That was only doing 18%, 16% in 18 months. So there was a, a gap growing, and that's called, became known as the productivity gap. Now actually back about 1990, 1991 when ARM was formed, it actually took about 100 man years to design an integrated circuit. When I actually started designing an integrated circuit, I did my first integrated circuit entirely on my own. It was a one man year project to give some scale to this thing. Uh, so 100 man years was still a manageable number but if you look at the, the way that that was going by today which is the full right hand end of that curve we would, be we would be talking because it's a log scale tens of thousands of man years of effort to design a circuit. Free clearly nobody can afford 10,000 plus man years of effort to design an integrated circuit They've got to produce a phone, it's got to get out by the end of the day. We have a finite engi engineering resource. What happened to it? Where did, the, uh, where did that productivity gap go? People were also predicting another gap. Verification was becoming a problem. How do you know that what you created was what you intended to create? So that would have pushed the numbers up even higher. Where did the gap go? Well, the gap went in the productivity revolution. And here's a revolution that happened in 1990 and nobody noticed it. It's like most revolutions actually. You usually see them in hindsight, you don't usually see them at the time. Reuse was the revolution that happened. <coughs> it made incremental design possible. It supports design partitioning and the ability to focus larger teams onto the design challenge and the task. It allows higher levels of abstraction languages and synthesis tools, it encourages methodologies, procedures and quality. All of those things were necessary because to produce an integrated circuit with a billion transistors on it from a finite resource and it was going to work certainly required different methodologies than the traditional ones. So significant changes happened there. And indeed it's estimated that more than 95% of the next generation product is based on the previous generation product. We'll come back to what that means in a few moments. But one of the things that was a, uh, a significant factor in this was the introduction of compute engines. Because if you can have a structure which is already defined, a simple structure which has been created before or one that can be uh, scaled mathematically, then clearly this helps you to produce a chip easier and be more confident that it's going to work as well. So, so structures like memory are good. Big logical functions like ALUs are good. Uh, big counters. St the sort of structures that you see inside compute elements are good. If you can put a computer down on a chip, then at least part of the design problem can move over to another group of people. We'll call them software engineers for a moment. But these are people who are now able to work without having to worry too much about the implementation detail of the silicon which is going to be underneath it. So let's look at compute engines because these turn out to be something which is quite important. Now, of course, we all know what a computer is. It's that thing that sits on your desk, a screen in front of you, a keyboard, a mouse. Well, of course, that's just the traditional view, and it's very much of a general purpose computer. Actually, if you look on Wikipedia, you find that a computer is a machine for computing. So it's a recursive definition in many respects. Uh, it is just a term used for algebraic manipulation of data, which incorporates time and state frequently. It includes phenomena ranging from human thinking to calculations involving narrower meaning. Um, it's usually used to exercise analogies or models of real world situations. I mean, it's a, a, a computer is simply calculating something based on state. We know where we are now, we want to try and make some prediction about the future, we want to try and create a, uh, a model 
a useful model of the future because you're interested in, in that as a human who is a consumer of this. So the differences between software and hardware have not made an appearance at this point because computation is not hardware or software, it is finding a solution to an equation bearing in mind state. So if we look at then some, pri some early computation machines, then this is generally recognized as the first computer, 87 BC. Um, there's some doubt about who was the, uh, the creator of this. Archimedes is, is popular, but I think the general consensus is, is this guy called Hyperacus. Um, okay, he didn't write his name on it when it was created, and the version which is over the, on the left is what was found in the Mediterranean, and the version on the right is uh, the modern recreation of it. It is actually a planetary motion calculator, and it tells you from states so of where we are today, where the planets will be, where they will appear in the sky in the future. It's a prediction machine. Uh, it was very special, uh, specialized, I have no doubt. But it wasn't until around the turn, uh, around 1700, around the turn of the Industrial Revolution, that the first machines really started to make, become available. And this is the orrery, which did the same thing. And you notice that that's, uh, you know, nearly 2,000 years later, uh, that this one was something which had, which had a commercial opportunity. You could actually theoretically go out and buy this thing, not on Amazon, I hasten to add. Um, but it was if you, quite an achievement to make this. If you want to think about what's involved with making a gear, making a precision piece of kit that, that uh, precise, um, reproducing it in volume, which may have only been hundreds, but it was still volume, uh, when your starting material is a piece of metal and a file, and a file is the way that you're going to create the teeth on it, then you realize just how much of a challenge it was to make something like this and to make it accurately enough. So I would say it's a computer, and the technology that supports it is mechanical technology. <coughs> Babbage's difference engine was a mechanical technology product. This, this fellow was introduced to automate the calculation of log tables, which were fundamentally the way that complex math was handled right up to my day. When I was in technical college, up to 18 or so, we were using log tables for doing complex calculations. Log tables and slide rules. The problem with uh, Babbage's difference engine was the technology was actually beyond his ability at that time. So they couldn't make this until around 2000, because only then could the backlash in the gears be, the gears be produced with sufficient accuracy that the machine could actually be made to work. So it was a uh, design for a computer where the technology ha wasn't actually able, of support, able to support it. More recently, we have the Enigma machine, which was used for encoding data uh, in the Second World War by, by the Germans. And uh, it was definitely a mechanical, or maybe electromechanical computer. And of course, the other end of that chain, you had people who were trying to decode those same, uh, those same, that same encoded data. And here is a Colossus computer, which is valve mechanical technology. The valves, so electronics, were starting to make an appearance. It was a, obviously a much faster, not terribly reliable uh, method. And the, the thing that's going on over here with, between the wheels is actually the memory. So it's, uh, it's interesting to think of memory in terms of, of a tape running around wheels, but that's the best that they could do at the time. Still a computer. The first general purpose computer was Baby, 1947. Getting awfully close to me, I was born 1949. Um, this is a digital computer, and it is perhaps the, the, the true uh, pre predecessor of the things that we would recognize as a general purpose computer, the thing on your desktop. Of course, it was way down on today's technology. But we mustn't forget things like, at the time, there was analog computers around. Tend not to be quite so popular today, or at least you think not. Uh, but actually, the first moon landings used analog computers for calculations because it wasn't actually possible to do it with digital computers. They weren't powerful enough. And it was realized that actually, you didn't need to know the answers that accurately. What you needed to have them was accurately enough. An engine, for example, on a space shot is only finitely predictable in terms of its power, so you have to be able to adjust continuously. So the idea of an analog computer w as a way of calculating that was, was not out of the uh, question whatsoever. It was, however, using solid-state electronics at that time, albeit in, in the form of discrete transistors. So are we looking then at the pinnacle of computing technology in these great high-performance machines? 
Or are we looking for it in the smart gadgets that surround us? Or on the cloud, perhaps? You know, where is the computer in the cloud? I think the answer is, is going to be perhaps a little bit of a surprise. The evolution of radio, I think, illustrates this quite nicely. Because over the era from 1925 to today, a radio still does pretty well the same as it did back then. It's obviously easier to tune, it's higher quality, you don't have to listen through it through headphones. But it still receives a signal from the ether and, it, and expresses it as a pressure wave, which you're able to hear. If you look at it as a computational issue, then the, uh, the, the calculation involved in a radio, all but the left-hand one to, uh, to, that I illustrated, is actually pretty constant. You still have the RF amplifier, the mixer, the IF amplifier, detectors, decoders, uh, power amplifiers and audio amplifiers. It's a fairly straightforward thing, and of course you'll find that each one of those blocks is really just calculating an equation. Its uh, implementation varies. So here's a valve implementation of that. The equations are solved with valves using analog technology throughout. Here's a transistor equivalent, again using analog technology. It doesn't matter too much that the calculations are not absolutely right in the case of a valve radio. You can always turn the volume up a little bit if it's a bit on the low side. You know, that's a practical reality. The reality is it's a human service that this, this capability is delivering. And of course today you've got an integrated circuit. You actually have no idea how that calculation is being done inside. It might be being done in analog, it might be being done in digital. It can be digitized at the interface and at the, uh, the interfaces and the process in time, inside can be digital. Frankly, it doesn't matter. The blocks are still the same. A little bit more sophisticated, but still the same. So the pinnacle of computing today is all of these things. Think of computers as that way. There is only input and output and processing. That's my view on this life. Hardware, software, analog, mechanical in the loop, they're all just age-related architectural decisions. The job of an engineer is to find a solution using the technology which is available. And those engineers back over that era from 87 BC through to today have just done that. They've applied what was known to the problem, they've come up with a solution which is an effective solution, as good as they could do in the day that was available. And that's what you'll be required to do, of course, in the next days. So, and this one appeals to the, uh, to the less technical in, the, uh, in this audience and to other audiences. So I've presented this in quite a number of forums and there's gasps. Quite surprising uh, when you, everybody recognizes, of course, of course an iPhone. But it's surprising uh, that most people haven't even read the little label which is on the back. Because the label on the back says it was designed in California and manufactured in China. Now, if you're a politician, there is a serious danger at this point that what you're going to make as a conclusion is anything which is clever is designed in California and anything which needs to be manufactured is manufactured in China. Therefore, there is absolutely no point in putting money into uh, research or development activities or encouraging business in any of those two areas because we've already lost the game. Of course, the reality is much more complex. But politicians don't always realize that. So when, they, when you talk about design, we also know that you're talking about design at many levels, not just at the external appearance of the screen, but also how things behave. And, um, and if you want to be a knight, instantly, you want to become sir or madam. Oh, is it madam? Do they do, I can't remember what the, the female equivalent of knight is, actually. Um, but if you want to be a knight, then it's, uh, it, according to this, it says, Jonathan Ive... Uh, Apple's head of design, uh, born in Chang or raised in Chingford, has been the brains behind many of Apple's products. Well, of course, you and I know that can't be true. There's going to be a lot of people involved in Apple's products. He may have been responsible for the look of it. He may have been responsible for the human interface of it. But he's certainly not responsible for the content of it. Uh, but, of course, the people out there who don't really understand electronic systems or what's inside them don't know that. The person that needs to be rewarded is this guy who did all the clever stuff. He did the design of the iPhone. So the many levels tends to get ignored. 
But once you start to pull it apart, and many ordinary people in the streets don't realize that things like an iPhone has got an inside. You don't take the back off to change the battery or anything else like that. It's a cool black obsidian structure which, uh, structure which may have been machined out of solid and had a stainless steel band put around the outside of it. Very much like the, uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings is forged in some... Um, uh, uh, sweatshop somewhere and they know nothing about the inside so it's quite a discovery for a lot of people to, to find that there is an inside and once you start looking before you get to the complex stuff like chips which everybody wants to talk about um, you discover there's a vibration motor in there look at that thing it's tiny how on earth do they make something like that where do they design it it doesn't grow on trees nobody picks it and puts it into an, I into an iPhone so we know it had to be created and the manufacturing process would have been really exciting similarly for the camera video camera, still camera complete with flash tap focus and it's 8x8x6 eight by eight by millimeters. it's tiny wonderful technology we have here and inside there are modules, and inside the modules there are insides. Quite a surprise even to quite a lot of technologists at this point incidentally to discover that inside an iPhone there is about 20 integrated circuits. They're not all on the smallest geometry processes, they're on different processes suitable for different applications that they're used for. You'll see a sprinkling of what's called ARM partners through this. This means these are people who do license technology from us for inclusion in products and chips that they make which get into products like this. Um, the board has two sides and you find there's a lot of stuff on the other side but hey think about the manufacturing problem about the board how do you put components on both sides of a board how do you put them on the other side without them dropping off you know it's, it's a small thing to say but manufacturing of something like this is a significant challenge. Um, if you look inside the the big chip down here the A4 chip which is recognized as the main processor I'm still not going to go into the core of the chip but just look at the packaging on this thing it's an integrated circuit it looks just like an ordinary integrated circuit package it's four millimeters thick top to bottom it's actually got three die inside it two memory chips on the top and the processor chip now that's exciting technology too it didn't just happen somebody had to be involved in the uh, in the design the manufacture of the uh, of the process and the creation of that it didn't just happen it happened as a result of this wonderful communal engineering activity that we do so inside an iPhone inside a smartphone as the general case this is pro broadly spe speaking a block diagram of all of the major objects therein I don't expect you to be able to see it the real thing I wanted to impress you is there's a lot there's a lot of blocks in there and most of them are associated with computation not just the ones associated with digital computation and none of it grew on trees so there's a lot of designers and manufacturers and Apple who are normally very secretive about this uh, were challenged by uh, uh, I think it was an American government agency to disclose their tier one suppliers uh, their tier one suppliers are the people who supply all of the components which finally go into uh, their products. It's not restricted to the iPhone, but it's typically the, uh, the people who are supplying components into the like of the iPhone. There's 159 of them listed there. Uh, thousands of designers, therefore, involved in them. Tens of thousands of engineers involved through the life cycle of those components globally. So these are not a product of just California or, uh, or, or China, but actually a product of the world. And that has to be emphasized. There are, of course, hundreds of Tier 2 and Tier 3 suppliers. These are people who are supplying those suppliers. And in fact, if you look at that list the of the 159 suppliers in there, ARM is not listed as one of them. We are a Tier 2 or a Tier 3 supplier. To the, uh, to, the, to the suppliers of Apple into things like the iPhone. So how much reuse are we talking about here? Well, let's put some numbers on this. Let's t say a mobile product has around 500 million gates of uh, SOC and 5 million lines of SOC code and it's a number which is doubling every 18 months broadly speaking. Um, designer productivity hasn't changed all that much so it's generally between uh, 100 and 1000 gates or lines per day 
Um, that's fully approved, qualified, installed lines per day and there's a lot of process which you have to go through before your, your product actually does get incorporated so although you can seem to be more productive than that, that's generally what it works out at on average. And a typical new design has the order of 50 to 100 person years of effort, that's still a large team, that's still a lot of cost. Uh, so to just on that calculation alone it shows that 99.5% of the design must be reused because 100 person years of effort, which is still a substantial effort, can't, is not enough to do a substantial amount of redesign. So it's not viable to do clean sheet product design, nor has it been since about 1995. This is, in many ways, good news because it actually says that this is the reason why a company becomes dominant in the area. It's not dominated because of its patent ownership. It's not dominated because it's, um, it's got the, all of the best engineers. It part, it's partly dominated there because it's got history. The people have got experience. The systems are, are, are in place. The mechanisms for it working. The, the whole thing is, is a well-oiled machine which enables the reuse. So hardware and software is only a part of a product and there are many components and subsystems which are involved in it which also need high levels of reuse. So moving smartly along. So you've got to consolidate and you've got to move on. You've got to, uh, you've got to be prepared to let go. You're an expert in something make it available so that other people can use it move on and allow them to use it if, you're, if your expertise is in pushing forward the frontier push forward the frontier but make sure that you allow those people to uh, to take it forward what you've, the, the baseline that you've established become one of the giants on which other people will stand on the shoulders of, of, of your shoulders I've got to move on a little bit because I'm getting a bit behind I talk too much um, it's worth remembering that people don't buy technology, they buy products. Products are something which satisfies a human need. Those are the verticals here. Transport, energy, uh, entertainment, health, security, communications. They break down into individual products like your phone or your MP3 player and so on. But those are the things that people buy. Technologies feed into that. Technologies allow products to be made. They, give the, they provide the tools and the techniques which will produce those products. The main thing about technologies is they cross over the, uh, the, the um, about technologies is they cross over the product lines. They enable more than one type of product. Some uh, technologies actually enable the creation of tools. So robots are a good example here because, of course, a robot is not really an end product in its own right. Most people don't actually buy robots. Uh, but robots enable the production of products. So technology, however, goes into robots. So some of, these, uh, some of the technologies go into production of what I would call subsystem tools, and the subsystems then, in fact, uh, go into the development or support the development of products. It's important to understand this. Science does not equal technology, does not equal product. Science is what essentially comes out of pure research. Technology is something which is ready to be used in a product, but product is things that people buy, ordinary people buy. And there is a big gap between those. A product is more than technology then, and businesses are primarily about making money, not about using technology. Uh, they have to provide things that people want to buy, and they have to provide it with a cash model that people are prepared to support. It's an un uh, unappreciated thing that it's not good enough to have a product, you also have to have a way of making it affordable. That's not just making it cheaper. So if you look at buying a phone, you buy your phone pretty cheap, but you actually pay for it down the road by, through its use. Um, businesses need product differentiation. They don't need the best product in the world. What they need is to be better than their competitors. This also tends to mitigate against doing things for the sake of it. So a design which incorporates technology, should have gone on as well, um, is not just going to incorporate new technology because it's there, it's only going to incorporate new technology if it offers a commercial advantage when it's deployed. 
And there is a risk associated with using new technology, so the offset has to be calculated as well. If you're going to use this new technology, then there is a risk that your product may not come out. That may be the difference between your business having a future and not. So companies are not going to take that risk anymore. They have to be very cautious about it. Globalization makes this ever more important because once upon a time your competition was in the same town as you, in the same country as you, now it's in the same world as you. The competi your competitor for a product, but also your competitor for a scientific ability. Nowadays you're in comp you personally are going to be in competition with somebody else who is out there in the world who is offering the same capability, the same skill set as you, ha you have. And unless you're better than he, are, he is or she is, then you are going to be the one who needs to be reconsidering what you do. Don't think of uh, globalization as purely taking away, however. It also provides an opportunity because it means that your skills can also be exported globally. Bear that in mind it's because it's seldom appreciated by businesses and certainly by individuals. Now I would argue that what we're seeing now is the start of uh, the electronic systems age. There has been many ages in life and it started with wood, stone, bronze and iron each one of which provided some additional capability to satisfy human need and it, and, and it displaced in some respects the one that went before because it was able to offer a little improvement and therefore the old fashioned way of doing it ceased to be relevant. We are moving into, having gone through mechanical, electrical and microelectronic, we're moving into the electronic systems age. This is going to dominate, I predict, until about 2030 and then something else will happen. But the electronic systems are where we're now at. Electronic systems are not electronics and software and mechatronics. They are all of those things together. They're delivering a functionality in the box because that's what people pay for. And, that, and the most effective solutions to that are the ones which are going to be the ones that dominate the market. Within that, you're going to play an important role. And you're going to be able to explain what you do to your mums and your dads, to the family, to the teachers in schools, to other people who inquire about it, in the sense of a contributing capability to electronic systems. And everybody knows what electronic systems are now. So what does ARM do? Very quickly, you can read that yourself, but the simplest aspect of it is we took a RISC processor and we packaged it in a way which hadn't been anticipated. That is, we made it available for use as a cell in an integrated circuit rather than for a pack use as a packaged device, which all CPUs or processors had been prior to that point. Not that revolutionary. Uh, the concept was simple enough. It turned out to be very difficult to do. It took us quite a few years before the, the mechanisms and the systems caught up about it, but that's a different lecture altogether. But the concept, at least, was simple. And, of course, history, as you say, is written by the winners. So uh, here you can see that same Tegra chip and you can see five ARM chips in there, five ARM cores in there, and there's a sixth one over to the uh, left which is not, uh, not as visible as the other ones. There is actually six CPUs inside that one, one billion gate chip. Now, a year ago, this was an example design that we, that we hand out to people who license uh, our technology from which they can take the bits that they want or actually rub out the bits that they don't want. Uh, this has 10 processors on board. So 18 months ago we were handing out uh, design kits, if you like, which incorporated 10 processors. We're already involved with people who are designing 20 processors on a chip. So Moore's Law is pushing this forward. Um, you can't just deliver the processes because there has to be a methodology behind it. The methodology has to be supported by cells and peripherals. How do you make the chips? But also by software. How do you design systems? How can you make uh, your product, the software that you used in your previous product, move forward into the next generations of products? How can you bring, bring a bigger design team to bear on this? How can I incorporate software that other people have designed rather than have to do it myself? It's all pursuit of that um, reuse and effective, uh, effectiveness that I was talking about earlier. And we have 900 global partners to help us to achieve that this, the, these days. It also means that to date we've shipped 40 billion CPUs. 
and we anticipate shipping 150 billion by, the, uh, by 2020. These are real numbers, uh, calculated numbers, they're not just a uh, wet finger. And we started from, uh, back in 1990, 12 engineers in a barn in Cambridge, which spun out of what was Acorn Computers, which came out of the BBC Computers in Schools program back in 19, what's the number, roughly speaking, uh, 1980, and then the roots in Cambridge University, 1971, 1975. Um, it seems like a long time, but of course we know now it's not long in comparison to the 35,000 years of our human history. I'm aware of my time. Um, the dream, of course, was to be a global uh, IP provider. The reality is, 20 th 2013, we are. Yet we're still a small company. We are the dominant. We are the world's leading IP provider in this space. We, ARM technology powers 90% of, of the smart electronic systems that are available in the world. Latest figure is 75% of all of the devices connected to the internet are ARM powered. That's wonderful news for us. It means that, that ARM effectively, our sales are supported by the internet. The internet is almost created for us. It's wonderful. It's where the 40 billion, uh, 40 billion CPUs are going where the 120 billion will, will go. 95% of all of the smart electronic systems that are being designed today are, designed on, are based on ARM technology. And yet, as a company, we're only 2,500 people big worldwide. That makes us small. Most of the dominant companies in the world are tens of thousands of people big. We're significantly less than that. We are nevertheless a FTSE 100 company, which puts us in the top 100 companies in the UK. Um, we have a market capitalization of 13 billion pounds, which sounds impressive. Um, we have a revenue of around 600 million, uh, profits 47%, R&D 30%. We spend 30% of what we earn on R&D. That makes us a technology company, no doubt about it. 25 offices worldwide, around 1,000 people in the UK, and 95% of what we do is exported. It's all good news. Uh, 2012, 20% 20, 20 growth. Difficult economic conditions? What difficult economic conditions? We grew 20% this year, we grew 20% last year, we grew 20% the year before that. That was in numbers, in profitability. Uh, we are all still getting pay rises. We have uh, modest bonuses. We have to say modest because there might be bankers around. Um, and we have 70 plus vacancies in the UK today. That's a growing industry. It's a good industry, but it's a novel industry. Our innovation and, und and efficiency underpins it all. Um, but our mission has changed slightly. Initially, we were supplying the CPU. That was our objective. Now we're enabling people to design complex electronic systems and to get them right, for them to be productive, economical, and reliable. And it's reuse that we're enabling them to do it by. Clearly, the CPU is still an important part of that, but it's not the only part of it. Now, looking to the future, and I'm not far from the end, the uh, mobile device trends actually gives you a little bit of a, an idea about what the consumer is interested in in our technology. Because what you see here is the consumer wants the little bit of technology which is visible to become invisible. So... Whatever we do to make our products, our existing products, better, make the displays better, make the interface more intuitive and so on, is going to make our technology less visible. So our, our, our end customers are asking us to make ourselves even less visible. We've got to do something about that. Society's challenges, you've seen them all, everybody knows about them. Electronic systems will not cure them but electronic systems will be necessary for their cures. Society will have to challenge, tackle all of these things. It will have to decide what the right approach is, and it will need electronic systems to implement those cures. But electronic systems will not cure it. So all of those people out there who think that the engineering and the scientists among us have got the cures for all of these things, and it's up to you guys to implement them, are wrong. We have the technology, the abilities, the tools, the methods to help in their solution, but not to solve them. Electronic systems are key enabling technologies, but not solutions in themselves. So to conclusions, 
They're a growing feature in our lives today and they will underpin society and our economy tomorrow. It's important that we maintain our presence in their global life cycle, that we maintain our presence in their global life cycles and do not become overly dependent on the continued beneficence of others. You can read that at leisure. Electronic systems, a message we have to put over, is magical but not magic. We are clever, but we're not magicians. It's a difficult one to put over this. It's difficult to explain why uh, you are actually brighter than somebody else. Um, and so uh, you, you need to be politicians when it comes to explaining that one. But we have to put it over. We are clever people. We are, in this area, we do know it very well. We're not being big-headed about it. But what we do is not magic. It's, it's heavily dependent on the advances others have made. To put a context on it, there is nobody in the world today who can grow an oak tree without an acorn. There's nobody who can grow grass without grass seed. We are not capable of producing even the simplest form of life, even though we might have some inklings of how, or start, uh, how it might do it. We're not nearly there. And the technology that we're using is even further away from it than that. It's important that we explain ourselves to the public because the public needs us and also because we need the public. We need them to approve, we need them to drive the politicians who do the approval of the budgets which help the research, which help the education, which encourage the industry. Because if they don't, it will go away and we will go away. We can't all be consumers. And electronic systems is the bridge between us and the public. Disciplined boundaries are administratively convenient, but they are counterproductive and they are dangerous for that reason. So there is a computer, computer science and there is an electronics group and there's a, me a mechanics group. Um, these are bad news. Convenient from an administrative point of view, but they break us up. Instead of being a unified body, we become a, dis a disorganized and disunified body. So our achievements don't talk for us. Time to start talking for ourselves, and thank you for listening. <laughs>